Um, thank you very much. I would like to uh, um, start thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to still give this talk, even though in a virtual setting. I am very upset that I cannot be there in person, especially because of the uh, new developments on the topic that I'm going to talk about today started at our last meeting in Banff. So I really wanted to be there, but next time. So um, Grime has already introduced a little bit of the theory of composites, but I'm going to go over some of the basics uh, so that everybody's on the same page. So when we work with composites, we need to differentiate at least two different lamp scales. We have the micro scale, that is the one where we do see the uh, heterogeneities. It's the one where we do see the two component materials. Phase one, here represented in white, and phase two, here represented in blue. And at this scale, uh, we will always assume to know the material properties of a phase one and phase two. And sometimes we, we may also know something about the geometry. We may know, for instance, uh, what the volume fraction, that is the ratio between the two materials is. Um, but what we want to do is knowing these pieces of information is to try to figure out what the response of the composite is going to be at the macro scale. That is basically the length scale of the, uh, at the same uh, level of the dimensions of the body. That is the one that you get when you zoom out so much that you do not see the heterogeneities anymore, but they kind of blind together, giving you this homogeneous material. So the goal is knowing some info about the micro scale, uh, definitely the material properties and some geometry. What can you say about the response of the composite at the macro scale? So let me introduce some math. Um, so here I have at the macro scale three local fields. So w is a scalar, U and V are vectors. And here I want you to notice that these are three fields uh, depends on time. And that is not because I'm considering any dynamics, uh, not at all. I suppose that all the applied fields are applied in a quasi-static manner. But it's because I'm assuming that at least one of the two components is a lossy so that the response of the uh, materials at the micro scale is definitely going to be dependent on the history of the applied field up to that moment of time. And for the uh, sake of simplicity, I am going to uh, write down the equations at the micro scale, not in terms of the fields in the time domain, but in terms of the fields uh, at, uh, in the frequency domain or in the Laplace transform domain. So here, P represents the Laplace transform parameter, but you can totally replace this with a frequency if you like. So what are the equations? Well, we have that V hat is a divergence of free field, U is the gradient of, the, of W, and then we have this relation between V and U that is the one that we really care about, the constitutive law. So the last relation there tells you what the response of V is going to be, when you know U, and you see that that matrix L depends on two things. Eh? That is the ones that we know, that are the ones that we know at the micro scale. It depends on the chi function, that is the indicator function. It's that function that takes a value one in phase one and value zero in phase two. So that will take account um, of the uh, uh, geometry of the composite. And then you have L1 and L2 that are the two scalars uh, representing the response uh, of the two phases at the micro scale. So what we want to do is to put all the equations together, we end up with that PDE and we want to solve it. And to do so, we need some boundary conditions. <coughs> and we get those uh, from the macro scale. So at the macro scale, Recording in progress. the, um, the uh, uh, fields are the volume averages of the fields at the macro scale. So here the bar denotes the volume average. And among these fields, uh, we need to assume that we know one of them. So specifically in this talk, I'll assume that I know U bar. So right later on, I will uh, refer to U bar as the input. We know it, okay? And it's the input because I'm assigning it through the boundary condition. So I know the volume average of U. What I want to do now is to solve the problem at the micro scale and find all the local fields and then compute the average of V 
And once I know the average of V, given that the average of U is given, then basically I know what the uh, properties of the composite are going to be at the macro scale. So how the composite behaves as a homogeneous material at the macro scale. And that info is contained in this new matrix uh, L star. Now, L star will depend on two things. As usual, it will depend on the chi function, so on the geometry of the material, and it will depend on L1 and L2, the material properties at the micro scale. Unless you work in a very, very special setting, it's basically impossible that you'll be able to find L star explicitly because a chi of X is very difficult to know at a, uh, in a precise way. We may have some info, like we may have its volume average, that is the volume fraction, but uh, and some maybe other info, but no more than that. So what we actually want to do in this talk is uh, to find bounds. So to find the uh, maximum and minimum output function that we can have. So we want to find the V bar um, for any moment of time. So here I have to go from the frequency domain slash Laplace transform domain back into the time domain. And I'm going to do it explicitly later on. But first, let me write down what L star is uh, explicitly in terms of the chi function and L1 and L2. So uh, this is basically the uh, topic of this workshop. So L star can be written in this form. It's the, uh, um, uh, it's the uh, uh, properties of the, oh, here I should have, sorry, I should have an I, an identity matrix. So L2 times I, uh, so the response of material two, plus 2F1 L2 times this function F. So you notice that F is uh, something that you may know very well, is the integral from negative one to one of this measure mu, that is a positive definite measure with unit mass over lambda minus z. So this formula is incredibly beautiful because it separates the dependence of L star from the material properties, and that dependence is incorporated in the parameter Z, you see that Z depends only on the material parameters and the dependence on the geometry, that that is hidden in the uh, measure. So the chi function is inside that new um, that you see there. Okay, so what I want to do is uh, to um, rewrite this in the time domain. As I said, I'm not gonna do it explicitly for this problem yet, but I, I'm going to answer transform back in the time domain. And what I want to do is uh, to uh, find bounds on the v-bar function, my output. And uh, I want to do this in the time domain, so for any moment of time t. And to do so, what I have to do is to optimize over all the microgeometries that I can have. So I have to optimize over all the uh, measures, uh, mu, that I can have. And uh, here I may assume that I know nothing about the material. So the only constraint that I will apply is the fact that the measure has a unit mass. I may know the volume fraction. So in that case, F1 will not be a parameter, but it will be um, a variation of parameter, but it will be fixed. Or I may know something else. So um, I first studied this problem during my PhD when I was interested in the viscoelasticity problem. So in that problem, it does make sense eh, to look for input functions, u bar, that are heavy side function. So what I'm gonna show you in a second is what happens when you apply a u bar function that, has, that is a heavy side function and what bounds you can get on v bar, the output for any moment of time by optimizing all, the, all these measures. Eh? And let me say that the optimization just boils down to some linear programming, so it, it's very easy. Okay, so let me start with case one, heavy side function that does make sense for the viscoelasticity problem because it leads to uh, the uh, relaxation uh, experiment. So this is the setup for material one. I'm going to assume that the response is going to be lossy. So even though the input is a constant function for t bigger than zero, I assume that the output is going to be a time-dependent function. Specifically, it's going to be a decreasing exponential. 
And for phase two, I'm going to assume that the material is non-lossy. So I have a constant input for T bigger than zero. I'll have a constant output for T bigger than zero. So I know already that due to the fact that one of the two phases <clears throat> is lossy, has this time dependent behavior uh, that will lead to some dissipation of energy. Also the composite will have a lossy behavior. And what I want to understand it is what the uh, maximum output and uh, a minimum output for the behavior of the composite is going to be if the two phases have this behavior. So this is what we found back then. Eh? Um, so you see three sets of bounds. Eh? Let me focus on the uh, uh, blue ones eh, for a second. So in blue, you see that you basically have the decreasing exponential and the constant function eh, that do represent the behavior of phase one and phase two. So those are the uh, maximum and the minimum uh, values of the output, depending on which interval of time you look at, when you have no information. So you know nothing about the material. So here you're optimizing over all the measures just by imposing that the uh, mass is unit, unitary. But what I want you to focus is uh, the uh, bouncing red. So you see that the bouncing red corresponds to the case where I do know the volume fraction. So for any moment of time, I am looking at what is the maximum and minimum response of the composite if I know that the composite has that volume fraction, but it could have any geometry, okay? And the optimization is done over all the geometries having that volume fraction. So you see is that those bounds coincide at one moment of time here around 0 0.7. And uh, so what that tells you is that at that moment of time, regardless of the microstructure, every composite having that volume fraction will have the same response. We were lucky, though, because here we looked at a case where the response, the initial response <clears throat> of the lossy phase is bigger than the initial response of the uh, non-lossy phase. But if you do switch the two, and this is what I'm going to show you in this slide, well, you don't have that amazing property anymore. You see that here the bounds don't cross, and so you don't have that moment of time at which the response of any composite depends only on the volume fraction that is fixed. OK, so the first goal then is the following. Can we then change the applied field? Can we use something else? rather than a heavy safe function, so that the bounds are always coincident at a certain moment of time for any choice of the material properties. Well, our first uh, uh, attempt was to consider some time harmonic fields with a discrete set of frequencies. So let me show you what is the input function that we consider here. So not heavy side function anymore, but just <clears throat> you bar now, is given by the real part of this sum, where beta k is uh, uh, basically represents the intensity of these uh, uh, sine functions uh, uh, with frequency omega k. And we don't know what the beta k are. We need to find it. But let's write down explicitly what the output is going to be in the uh, time domain. So the output will be given by the output that you would have if the material was made of uh, uh, phase two only, plus it is a term where you have the volume fraction in front that you may know or not. So that could be a fixed parameter or something that you have to optimize as well. And, uh, um, and then you see again the appearance of that f mu function that is again uh, defined in terms of these uh, positive uh, uh, Borel measure uh, with unit mass. And the z again depends only on uh, the material parameters uh, at those uh, that set of frequencies. Okay, so the goal now is can we find the intensities beta k? so that at time t equals t naught, the bounds on V are coincident. In other words, can we find beta k so that when t equals t naught, there is no dependence on the measure whatsoever? And the response of the composite will just depend on the volume fraction. So if we want to achieve that, 
then you need to look at the uh, uh, expression in the square brackets in the output function. And there you see that what well, basically we want when t equals t naught, we have that the exponential is one. Basically what you want is that that expression that depends on the measure, that depends on the microstructure is basically constant. That, that's what you want. And I uh, can rephrase this uh, in this way. So uh, the soup among all the measures uh, of the difference between those the two quantities uh, is smaller than uh, a certain um, uh, parameter epsilon that is small enough. Okay, so we do have a theorem for that. And let me show that to you. The theorem is written in terms of alpha k rather than beta k, but you see the relation between the two. If I know L2 and L2 is a given, is one of the uh, data of the problem, then knowing uh, finding alpha k or beta k is exactly the same. Okay, so let's have a look at that. So this is the theorem. So the first part is all about uh, saying how to pick disease. So let me show you again what disease are. So the uh, uh, function z depends only on the material parameters uh, that on a, uh, they do depend on the uh, frequencies omega k. So you choose the frequencies omega k. So you know what the z of omega k are. So you know what z1, z2, and so on are going to be. And all you have to do is to make sure that those z's are far away from the interval negative 1, 1. So this is, this is what the first part of the theorem says. So if that is true, then you do have that that soup is smaller than epsilon m. If, and, and that will ensure that the bounds are indeed measure independent. If you choose the alpha k uh, that are related to the intensities of the applied field in that way, where, uh, so I'm looking at equation 5.3 where the uh, T and Z are Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind of degree M. And if you choose alpha K like that, then at time T equals T naught, the bounds are going to be coincident. The bounds are going to be measure independent. Okay, so let's go back then to that example where we first applied a heavy side function and we didn't get that the bounds were tight at any moment of time. So for that same example, now, what I'm doing is uh, applying uh, as an input a discrete set of frequencies where the intensities are chosen according to the theorem that I just showed to you. So the alpha k are those are related to those uh, Chebyshev polynomial. And what you see is that the time t equals zero, the bounds where the volume fraction is known are indeed coincident. And this is regard, I can do this regardless uh, of what the material properties are. So this holds for any um, L1 and L2. I just have to uh, make sure that the Zs are far away from the interval negative one, one. And then I have to pick the intensities uh, in terms of these attributive polynomial. That's it. And I do have that the bounds coincide at time t equals zero. Okay. Now, um, if I go back here, you see that in the top uh, uh, picture, um, I have one more case. That is the case where I also know that the composite is isotropic, and that involves uh, considering further moments of the measure. Can I do that in this setting? Well, the answer is yes. We can incorporate um, further moments of the measure in addition to the fact that the mass has to be uh, equal to one. And here, I'm just going to show you one example where the uh, black bounds correspond to the case where uh, the, uh, I just have the uh, zeroth moment of the measure. The second case where I have that on top of the volume fraction. And the last case uh, where I also consider the first moment of the measure. And as before, you do see that the bounds get tighter and tighter the uh, more pieces of information I consider regarding the geometry of the composite. And they do coincide at time t equals zero. That is exactly what I want, to have the bounds that are measure independent at that moment of time. Last uh, um, thing about this uh, discrete set of frequencies. So now um, I want to ask another question that is uh, how to determine the output v naught at a given frequency omega naught 
when it is not possible to have an input at that frequency. So I can only apply an input that is given by a set of frequencies that do not have nothing to do with uh, omega naught. Can I still say something about V naught at time t? Well, yes. So here in these two pictures, you have to focus at what happens at time t equals zero. So there you see that the bounds in red that are the bounds that you have on the function v bar when you apply a set of discrete frequencies do uh, have uh, the exact value that you would have if you were able to apply an input at the frequency omega naught in there. So um, we can estimate at time t equals zero, the response uh, of the uh, composite at a certain frequency by using an input at another set of frequencies. All right. So, okay, I'm writing time. Last part of my talk is uh, about using a continuum uh, of frequencies. So a continuous spectrum of frequencies as an input function rather than a discrete set of frequencies. What can I get there? All right, so let's consider these very last case, uh, continuous spectrum of frequencies. So in this case, my input function, u bar, will be given by the real part of the integral from zero to one of the amplitude beta that depends on this parameter s times this complex exponential where um, uh, the uh, uh, frequencies now omega are functions of this parameter s. Okay, so let's write down the output. So as before, the output at time t will be given by the output that I have if the material were made of a material two only, plus this uh, quantity that, as before, depends on f mu, where f mu is defined exactly in the same way as before. Okay, so here the idea is as before, how do I choose the uh, beta s? So how do I choose the amplitudes so that the response of the composite, the output function, is uh, measure independent at time t equals t naught. So as before, I'm going to provide a theorem that does that, but um, I'm going to uh, phrase it in terms of alpha s. So it is a product between the intensities, what we actually want, beta s, and this parameter L2. So let's uh, have a look at the, uh, um, at the uh, main result. So the first part of the theorem, as before, in the uh, set of discrete frequencies, uh, is uh, just about making sure that the uh, z that we uh, choose are in a certain relation with the integral with the interval negative one one. Specifically here, we need to make sure that once we choose the uh, trajectory of the frequency omega s, then the z of omega s. So let me remind you what z is. Eh? So z depends on uh, l one and l two, as is shown at the bottom of this picture. So uh, we need to make sure that the z of omega s traces a curve c and that its complex conjugate z bar traces a curve c bar so that their union c uh, united with uh, c bar is a closed curve encircling the interval negative one one. Then if that happens, all I have to do in order to guarantee that my bounds will be measure independent at time t equals t naught is to choose my coefficients alpha s, like in the slide, where the parameter k that you see at the numerator can be chosen as you like. So you can set that equal to zero as well. If you do that, then what happens is that the output function at time t equals t naught depends on the response that you have of the material if, as if it was made of material two only. Plus, it is a term here that depends only on the volume fraction and eventually on the first moment of the measure, if you have that available. But if you don't, you can just set k equal to zero. So this first part of the theorem it tells you how to choose the intensities so that you do have a coincidence of the bounds at time t equals t naught. 
But this doesn't add much to the conversation because we were able to do that even with a discrete set of frequencies. So here we can go a little bit farther and we can say that, um, I'm not gonna read the whole statement, but um, basically here we say that if you choose uh, the trajectory of the uh, frequency omega as a function of s, uh, and so that the uh, z function satisfies some special properties, specifically here, if z at omega at zero is real as well as z of omega one, and they are outside, of the interval negative one one, then if uh, uh, the function z does not take any real value in negative one one, you have that the bounds are measure independent, not just the t naught, but for any moment of time. So let me show you some numerical results. So this is just an example of a trajectory that does satisfy all the properties that they just listed. And here's the corresponding results. So in blue, you see the bounds on the output function, the uh, uh, response of the composite when I have no info. And in uh, um, red, you see the response when I know the volume fraction. And it's not a mistake that you don't see the bounds uh, when you look at the red case, but you see two coincident curves. Because in this case, regardless of the microgeometry of the composite, we have that the response of the composite is going to be the same if I choose the volume fraction only for any moment of time t and not just for time t equals t naught. So this is very uh, striking uh, because again, it means that when I optimize over all the possible microstructures, uh, the only thing that matters uh, is just the volume fraction. The uh, microgeometry of the composite does play any, doesn't play any role uh, here if I choose the applied field in that very, very special way. OK, so um, I'll stop here. Um, I, I think I still have a couple of minutes for questions. I just want to uh, thank you all for your attentions and hear some uh, references. Thank you very much for a nice talk. And we have time for questions. Uh, th thank you, Ornella. Uh, very interesting uh, talk. Um, so so I, I'd like to understand you. You're choosing in the continuum case. You're choosing not just beta of s. You're also choosing omega of s. No, uh, yeah. So um, omega s, you choose that at the very beginning, okay? And then the beta of s will be given to you by the theorem. So uh, here's the theorem. Yes, that's that's what you do. Uh, so, so, so but right. So I but wanted. You, 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 Use omega s so that the some conditions are satisfied. Ah, okay, yeah. So, so you you need to choose omega of s so that you have this closed curve condition, right? Correct. Correct. Uh -huh. So if you do that, then uh, roughly speaking, everything boils down to the uh, application of the residue theorem. Okay, and then your um, uh, your coefficient really does not depend on time because in the discrete case it was approximately independent, right? It was no, 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 no. Oh well, yes, but it was. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. But um, uh, let me go back to the theorem. It was just epsilon uh -huh. within epsilon, epsilon m. Correct, but epsilon goes down uh, um, to uh, converges exponentially to zero um, when m goes to um, infinity. So if you pick a uh, high enough, a high enough number of uh, uh, frequencies, uh, omega k, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just w wanted to point out that if epsilon were actually zero, you could probably apply this theory of exact relations because when something truly does not depend on the microstructure, then you can apply the same technique. Hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I see. I see your point. Mm -hmm. 